equal to marking on the circular scale into least count is equal to 25 into 0 0.001 centimeter is equal to 0 0.025 centimeter. 4. Determination of correction due to zero is error is equal to 25 into the error is positive. 0 .001 then correction is equal to is equal to minus positive zero error point is zero equal to five minus zero point zero two five centimeter is Four. equal to determination of zero point zero zero five centimeter twenty five in the error is positive zero point zero zero one correction is radius of is equal to y minus zero error pitch of zero equal to five minus zero point one zero two five centimeter is Four. equal to least determination of zero point zero 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 centimeter zero point zero zero one centimeter determination of zero point zero zero one centimeter is equal to minus positive zero point is equal to zero point zero zero point zero two five centimeter correction is equal to least determination of zero point zero 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 two centimeter minus twenty five zero point zero one five centimeter. Place the given wire in between stud A and movable screw B in vertical plane and turn the ratchet in the clockwise direction till the ratchet becomes free. Note the number of divisions through which the screw moves on the main scale from the left of the zero mark on the circular scale. Note the circular scale reading which coincides with the baseline of the main scale. Calculate the observed diameter of the wire by the formula. Observed diameter is equal to number of divisions on main scale into pitch plus number of divisions on the circular scale into least count, which is equal to 2 into 0 0.1 centimeter plus 76 into 0 0.001 centimeter is equal to 0 0.276 centimeter. Calculate the corrected diameter by the formula. Corrected diameter is equal to observed diameter minus zero correction. Repeat the experiment two more times and hence calculate the corrected diameter. Find the mean diameter. Mean diameter is equal to D1 plus D2 plus D3 upon 3 is equal to 0 0.251 plus 0 0.253 plus 0 0.252 upon 3 centimeter is equal to 0 0.756 upon 3 centimeter is equal to 0 2.52 cm. Find the mean radius by the formula. Mean radius is equal to mean diameter upon 2 which is equal to 0.252 upon 2 cm is equal to 0.126 cm. To identify parenchyma and sclerenchyma tissues in plants, Striped muscles, fibers and nerve cells in animals from prepared slides and to draw their label diagrams. Materials required Permanent slides of parenchyma tissues Sclerenchyma tissues Striped muscle fibers and nerve cells 
compound microscope. Procedure Observe the permanent slides one by one under a compound microscope. Observation 1. Plant tissues A. Parenchyma tissues The slide shows numerous cells. The parenchymata cells are isodimetric. From isodimetric, it implies that almost all cells are equal in length and width. At the corners of the cells are present intercellular spaces. Each cell possesses a large central vacuole. Each cell has peripheral cytoplasm with a prominent nucleus. Each cell has thin cell wall. Inference Parenchymata cells make simple tissues. Parenchymata cells are living cells and a precursor of all other cells. These cells are present in the soft areas of plants such as stems, leaves, roots, flowers and fruits. The important function of these cells is photosynthesis or storage or helping in flotation. B. Sclerenchyma tissues Sclerenchymatous cells are dead cells. They have evenly thickened hard cell walls. They have very little or no protoplasm. They have hard lignified secondary walls. They can be divided into two types. A. Fibrous sclerenchyma. B. Sclerides. Fibrous sclerenchyma. 1. They are highly elongated, narrow, and spindle-shaped with pointed end walls. 2. Adjacent fibers have simple oblique pits. 3. The only function they perform is to provide mechanical strength. Otherwise, these fibers are empty and dead. Sclerides 1. They are highly thickened, dead sclerenchymatous cells which have very narrow cavities. 2. They may occur singly or in groups and are isodimetric in nature. 3. They are sometimes called grit or stone cells to verify the laws of reflection of sound. Apparatus required Two aluminium tubes highly polished from inside with a length of 25 cm and diameter 2 cm. 2. Animal tissues A. Striped muscle fibers. The slide shows large number of long cylindrical fibers that are enclosed in a membrane called sarcolemma. The fibers are non-tapering and wide. The fibers are multinucleated. The nuclei lie towards the periphery of the fibers. The cytoplasm of each fiber is called sarcoplasm. It is divided into large number of myofibrils. Each myofibril bears alternate light and dark band. Thus, these cells show longitudinal and transverse striations. The cells are surrounded and held by connective tissue. Inference the observation of slide shows the presence of striated muscles. It is because they are long cylindrical fibers having myofibrils which make striations tightly packed. The muscles give contratractability and strength to the voluntary muscle. These muscles work according to our will. They get tired when overworked. 
B. Nerve cell A nerve cell or a neuron has a large body called cyton. The cyton has a prominent nucleus. Cyton has cytoplasmic projections called dendrites. One of the dendrite is long and is called axon. A group of axons held together by a connective tissue is called a nerve. The axons are covered with medullary sheath or myelin sheath. At the nodes of Ranvier, the myelin sheath is absent. A membrane called neurilemma surrounds the sheath. The nerve endings are attached to muscles. Inference From the above observation, it is clear that a nerve cell of a large cyton with a prominent nucleus such that cyton has cytoplasm projections called dendrites. One of the dendrite is long and is called axon. The axons or fibers are packed together to make a nerve for the transfer of impulses. A. To observe the action of zinc, iron, copper and aluminium metals on the following salt solutions. 1. Zinc sulfate solution ZnSO4 aqueous 2. Ferrous sulfate solution FeSO4 aqueous 3. Copper sulfate solution CuSO4 aqueous 4. Aluminium sulfate solution Al2SO43 aqueous B. Arrange zinc, iron, copper and aluminium metals in the decreasing order of reactivity based on above results. Apparatus required. Four sets of test tube rack with clean test tubes. 400 cc beakers. Chemicals required. Small pieces of clean or rubbed copper iron, zinc and aluminium in the form of wires, turnings and powder. Saturated aqueous solution of copper sulphate, CuSO4 aqueous. Saturated aqueous solution of ferrous sulphate, FeSO4 aqueous. Saturated aqueous solution of zinc sulphate, ZnSO4 aqueous. Saturated aqueous solution of aluminium sulfate Al2SO43 aqueous. Procedure Take 400 cc beakers and label them copper sulfate solution, ferrous sulfate solution, zinc sulfate solution, and aluminium sulfate solution, respectively, with a marker pen. Collect about 20 cc of saturated solutions of copper sulfate, ferrous sulfate, zinc sulfate and aluminium sulfate in the respective beakers marked above from the common shelf. Set 1. Take four test tubes and label them A, B, C and D. In each test tube, pour about 5 cc of copper sulfate solution. 1. In the test tube A, introduce a small piece of copper rubbed by sandpaper. 2. In the test tube B, introduce a small piece of iron rubbed by sandpaper. 3. In the test tube C, introduce a small piece of zinc rubbed by sandpaper. 4. In the test tube D, Introduce a small piece of aluminium rubbed by sandpaper. Wait for 5 minutes and then pour off copper sulfate solution from each test tube into the beaker. Observe the colour of metals in each test tube.
observations. 1. In case of copper metal, no change in color takes place. 2. In case of iron metal, a reddish deposit of copper is formed on its surface. 3. In case of zinc metal, a reddish deposit of copper is formed on its surface. 4. In case of aluminium metal, a reddish deposit of copper is formed on its surface. Conclusions 1. Copper is the least reactive metal. 2. Iron, zinc and aluminium are more reactive than copper. Set 2. Wash the test tubes A, B, C and D with water. Pour 5 cc of ferrous sulphate solution in each of the test tube. One, in the test tube A, introduce a small piece of copper rubbed by sand paper. Two, in the test tube B, introduce a small piece of iron rubbed by sand paper. Three, in the test tube C, introduce a small piece of zinc rubbed by sand paper. Four, in the test tube D, introduce a small piece of aluminium rubbed by sandpaper. Wait for five minutes and then pour a ferrous sulphate solution from each test tube into the beaker. Observe the color of metals placed in each of the test tube. Observations 1. In case of copper metal, no change in color takes place. 2. In case of iron metal, no change in color takes place. 3. In case of zinc metal, a gray deposit of iron is formed on its surface. 4. In case of aluminium metal, a gray deposit of iron is formed on its surface. Conclusions 1. Copper metal is the least reactive. It is already proved in set 1. 2. Iron metal is less reactive than zinc and aluminium. Set 3. Wash the test tubes A, B, C and D with water. Pour 5 cc of zinc sulphate solution in each of the test tube. 1. In the test tube A, introduce a small piece of copper rubbed by sandpaper. 2. In the test tube B, Introduce a small piece of iron rubbed by sandpaper. 3. In the test tube C, introduce a small piece of zinc rubbed by sandpaper. 4. In the test tube D, introduce a small piece of aluminium rubbed by sandpaper. Wait for 5 minutes and then pour off zinc sulphate solution from each test tube into the beaker. Observe the color of metals placed in each test tube. Observations 1. In case of copper metal, no change in color takes place. 2. In case of iron metal, no change in color takes place. 3. In case of zinc metal, no change in color takes place. 4. In case of aluminium metal, light silvery grey deposit of zinc is formed. Conclusions 1. 
as aluminium metal reacts with zinc sulfate solution. Therefore, it is most reactive. 2. Zinc is more two. reactive than in iron, case of iron and metal. is already proved in no set change two. In 3. Iron is more reactive than copper is proved in set 1. 4. Copper is the least reactive metal is proved in set 1. Set 4. Wash the test tubes A, B, C and D with water. Pour 5 cc of aluminium sulfate iron solution metal. already Each proved test no set change two. Two. 3. Iron one. is more reactive than tube copper a, is it produced a small one. piece of copper rubbed Four. by sandpaper. Copper is the least two. reactive metal in the test tube B introduce a small piece of set iron Four. rubbed by Wash sandpaper. Wash the test tubes A, B, C and Three. D with in water. In the test tube C, Pop introduce a small piece of zinc rubbed by sandpaper. 4. In the test tube D, introduce a small piece of aluminium it rubbed produced by a small paper. piece of copper rubbed four. by sandpaper. Wait for paper. five minutes. Is the least two. And then pour metal. off aluminium sulfate solution from each test tube into the beaker. Observe the color of metals placed in each test tube. Observations 1. In case of copper metal, no change in color takes place. 2. In case of iron metal, no change in color takes place. 3. In case of zinc metal, no change in color takes place. 4. In case of aluminium metal, no change in color takes place. Conclusions As already proved in set 3 1. Aluminium metal is the most reactive, therefore, it does not react with its own salt, that is, aluminium sulphate. 2. Zinc metal is more reactive than iron and copper. 3. Iron metal is more reactive than copper. 4. Copper metal is the least reactive. B. Order of activity of metals in decreasing order. From the above experiments, it can be concluded. 1. Aluminium is the most reactive metal. 2. Zinc is less reactive than aluminium, but more reactive than iron and copper. 3. Iron is less reactive than aluminium and zinc, but more reactive than copper. 4. Copper is the least reactive metal. Thus, the order of reactivity of metals in the decreasing order is Aluminium is greater than zinc, greater than iron, greater than... Procedure for Displacement Reaction Pour about 50 cc of copper sulphate solution in a 100 cc beaker. Also half fill a test tube with copper sulphate solution and label it A. This solution A is for comparison. Take three clean iron nails. Place two iron nails in the copper sulphate solution and keep the third nail as it is for comparison. Cover the beaker with a glass disc and leave it undisturbed for half an hour. After half an hour, 
take out the nails and compare their surfaces with the third nail kept for comparison. Compare the color of copper sulfate solution in the beaker after the experiment with the sample A kept for comparison. Observations To start with, copper sulfate solution is blue in color and all the nails silvery gray in color. When the nails are taken out from the copper sulfate solution after half an hour, you find the surface is covered with brick red deposit. The color of the copper sulfate solution when compared with test sample A is much lighter, that is, it fades. Conclusions Brick red deposit on the iron nails is on account of the deposition of copper metal. The blue color of copper sulphate fades on account of the deposition of copper ions in the copper sulphate solution. Note, if the nails are kept in copper sulphate solution for few hours, the blue color completely disappears and instead a light green solution is formed. It is because the copper two ions are completely displaced by ferrous ions which are light green in color. The reaction between iron and copper to prove that the particles of matter are in reaction. a state of color. In this reaction, the more active metal iron displaces the less active metal, which is copper ions, from its salt solution CuSO4. The chemical reaction is represented as follows. CuSO4 aqueous blue in color plus ferrous solid silver gray form FeSO4 aqueous light green plus copper solid brick red. To study saponification reaction for the preparation of soap. Apparatus required A steel bowl of 1 liter capacity A steel spoon with long handle Two beakers of 200 milliliters capacity Four empty ice cream cups Chemicals required 100 milliliter of vegetable oil such as coconut oil or mustard oil 25 grams of solid sodium hydroxide 5 grams of common salt Water Measuring cylinder Procedure Place 25 gram of sodium hydroxide or caustic soda in a beaker. Measure 50 milliliter of water with measuring cylinder. Pour water slowly in the beaker containing caustic soda. Stir the mixture gently with a steel spoon. You notice that beaker becomes very hot. Measure 100 milliliter of water with measuring cylinder. Pour this water slowly in the caustic soda solution by constant stirring. Go on stirring water till caustic soda dissolves completely to form a colorless solution. Cover the beaker containing caustic soda solution with some china plate or cardboard and leave it undisturbed for 24 hours. After 24 hours In this time, the caustic soda solution cools down to the room temperature. Transfer the coconut oil in a steel bowl. If the coconut oil is in semi-solid state, warm it so that it melts. Pour about 10 ml of caustic soda solution in the coconut oil in the form of thin stream. Stir the mixture continuously for 2 minutes. Repeat the process till all the caustic soda is added in the coconut oil. 
you find that the mixture becomes viscous and thick and whitish in color. This thick viscous paste is soap. Dissolve 5 grams of common salt in about 15 milliliter of water. Add this common salt solution into the soap. Gently stir for at least 10 minutes. You notice that soap precipitates and floats up the watery layer of salt solution. Pour about 100 milliliter of fresh water in a beaker. Scoop the soap from the steel container and pour it in the water. Stir gently. This washing with water removes excess of caustic soda from the soap. With help of a spoon, pour off the soap in the empty ice cream cups. Cover the cups with cardboard and leave them undisturbed for a couple of days. Your soap is ready for use. 1. To make test tube hydrometer using a test tube. 2. To determine RD of any two liquids. Apparatus required. Clean hard glass test tube about 15 cm long. Measuring cylinder of 500 cc about 20 to 25 cm long. Millimeter graph paper, pair of scissors, cello tape, water, lead shots, alcohol, and brine solution. Procedure Take a 500 cc measuring cylinder and pour in it about 400 cc of water. Take a millimeter graph paper and cut a strip from it, which is 15 cm long, equal to the length of the test tube and 1 cm wide. Slip the graph paper strip into the test tube and hold it in position by a small strip of tape. Add about 20 lead shots in the test tube and try to float it in the cylinder filled with water. If the test tube floats in a tilted position, add few more lead shots till the test tube starts floating in an upright position. Add four lead shots so as to increase the stability of floating test tube. Read the length of test tube immersed in water in millimeters and record it. The length of test tube immersed in water, H water, is equal to 96 mm. Pour off water from the cylinder. Fill the cylinder with brine solution and float the test tube in it. Read the length of test tube immersed in brine solution in millimeters and record it. The length of test tube immersed in the brine solution, H brine, is equal to 80 mm. Pour off brine solution from the cylinder. Wash the cylinder with water and allow it to dry. Fill the cylinder with alcohol and float the test tube in it. Read the length of test tube immersed in alcohol in millimeters and record it. The length of test tube immersed in alcohol, H alcohol, is equal to 120 mm. Observations and calculations Length of test tube immersed in water, H water, is equal to 96 mm. Length of test tube immersed in brine solution, H brine, is equal to 80 mm. Length of test tube immersed in alcohol, 
H alcohol is equal to 120 millimeter. Therefore, relative density of brine solution is equal to H water upon H brine is equal to 96 millimeter upon 80 millimeter is equal to 1.2 and therefore relative density of alcohol is equal to H water upon H alcohol is equal to 96 millimeter upon 120 millimeter which is equal to 0 0.8. To find the pH of the following samples by using pH paper or universal indicator. 1. Dilute hydrochloric acid. 2. Dilute sodium hydroxide, NaOH solution. 3. Dilute ethanoic acid solution. 4. Lemon juice. 5. Water. 6. Dilute sodium bicarbonate solution. Apparatus required. Strips of pH paper. Six test tubes and a test tube rack. Dropper washed with distilled water. Standard pH color chart. Glazed tile. Chemicals required. Dilute hydrochloric acid. Sodium hydroxide solution. Dilute ethanoic acid, lemon juice, sodium bicarbonate solution, beaker containing distilled water. Procedure Rinse each of the test tubes with about 2 ml of distilled water only and place them in the test tube rack. Pour about 2 ml of distilled water in each of the test tubes. Now, in the first test tube, add about 1 ml of dilute hydrochloric acid and label it A. In the second test tube, add about 1 ml of sodium hydroxide solution and label it B. In the third test tube, add about 1 ml of ethanoic acid and label it C. In the fourth test tube, Add about 1 ml of lemon juice and label it D. In the fifth test tube, add 1 ml of water and label it E. In the sixth test tube, add about 1 ml solution of sodium bicarbonate and label it F. Shake the contents of each test tube thoroughly. Take six strips of good quality pH paper and place them flat on the dry glazed white tile. On these papers, mark the letter A for first test tube, B for second test tube, C for third test tube, D for fourth test tube, E for fifth test tube and F for the sixth test tube. Take the dropper and suck in the contents of the first test tube A. Pour one drop of the contents on the pH paper labelled A. Repeat the experiment by pouring a drop of the contents of B, C, D, E and F test tubes respectively on the relevant pH paper. Match the color change in the pH paper with the standard pH color chart. You observe that color change in pH paper in case of sample A matches with the color of pH 1 in the standard pH color chart. Color change in pH paper in case of sample B matches with the color of pH 14 in the standard pH color chart. 
Color change in pH paper in case of sample C matches with the color of pH 3 in the standard pH color chart. Color change in pH paper in case of sample D matches with the color of pH 2 in the standard pH color chart. Color change in pH paper in case of sample E matches with the color of pH 7 in the standard pH color chart. Color change in pH paper in case of sample F matches with the color of pH 9 in standard pH color chart. Conclusions The sample A of hydrochloric acid has pH 1 and hence is acidic in nature. The sample B of sodium hydroxide solution has pH 14 and hence is basic in nature. The sample C of ethonic acid solution has pH 3 and hence is acidic in nature. The sample D of lemon juice has pH 2 and hence is acidic in nature. The sample E of water has pH 7 and hence is neutral in nature. The sample F of sodium bicarbonate solution has pH 9 and hence is basic in nature. To determine the velocity ratio, we are mechanical advantage MA of a single movable pulley system and hence find its efficiency with the increase in load. Apparatus required A pulley stand Two single fixed pulleys A thin but strong cotton string reel a set of 50 gram slotted weights, a pre weighted scale pan, a half meter scale, a weight box, a spring balance, an iron stand. Procedure Suspend one of the fixed pulleys from the uppermost hook. Take about 2 meter long cotton thread and tie its one end to the hook. Pass the string around the second pulley and then the pulley which is suspended at the higher platform. The lower pulley acts as movable block whereas upper pulley acts as fixed block. Connect 50 gram 4 slotted weight to the hook of movable block. Connect pre-weighted scale pan to the free end of the string and record its weight. Place a half meter scale along the setup and record the position of scale pan X and position of slotted weight Z. Place small weights in the scale pan from the weight box till the scale weight just starts sliding down. Allow the scale pan to move down till it touches the position Z. Record the final position of slotted weights attached to the movable pulley. Observations and Calculations
calculate and record the distance through which they rise up. This is the distance d through which the load moves up. Calculate and record the distance through which the scale pan moves down. This is distance d through which effort acts. Record the weights, the scale and add them to the weight of scale pan so as to calculate the effort E acting vertically downward. Repeat the experiment for the slotted weights of 100 gram force, 150 gram force and 200 gram force and 250 gram force. Calculate mechanical advantage, velocity ratio and Efficiency of machine. Observations and calculations. Serial number. Weight of scale pan. Weights placed in scale pan. Effort acting on pulley system. Load lifted by movable pulley L. Mechanical advantage. MA equal to L divided by E distance through which load move D distance through which effort moves D velocity ratio VR equal to D divided by D new equal to MA divided by VR 18 gram force 30 gram force 50 gram force 50 gram force divided by 30 gram force equal to 1.66 20 centimeter 40 centimeter 40 divided by 20 equal to 1.66 divided by 2 equal to 0 0.88 equal to 88 percent 2 12 gram force 43 gram force, 55 gram force, 100 gram force, 100 gram force divided by 55 gram force is equal to 1.81. 20 centimeter, 40 centimeter, 40 divided by 20 equal to 2. 1.81 divided by 2 equal to 0.91 equal to 91 percent 3 12 gram force 68 gram force 80 gram force 150 gram force 150 gram force divided by 80 gram force equal to 1.87 20 centimeter 40 centimeter 40 divided by 20 equal to 2 1.87 divided by 2 equal to 0 0.94 equal to 94%. 4. 12 gram force, 93 gram force, 105 gram force, 200 gram force. 200 gram force divided by 105 gram force is equal to 1.90. 20 centimeter. 40 centimeter 40 divided by 20 equal to 2 1.90 divided by 2 is equal to 0 0.95 equal to 95 percent conclusion velocity ratio of pulley system is a constant quantity the mechanical advantage increases with the increase in load Mechanical advantage is always less than velocity ratio. The efficiency of machine increases with the increase in To trace the path of ray of light incident normally on the refracting face of an equilateral prism and hence calculate angle of deviation. Apparatus required Equilateral glass prism, 5 white sheets of paper, 4 sharp common pins, 
सेलो टेप जोमेट्रिकल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स वुडन ड्रॉइंग बोर्ड प्रोसीजर स्प्रेड अ व्हाइट शीट ऑफ पेपर ऑन द वुडन ड्रॉइंग बोर्ड एंड सिक्योर इट बाय पेस्टिंग सेलो टेप एट इट्स कॉर्नर्स इन द मिडल ऑफ व्हाइट शीट प्लेस एन इक्विलैटरल प्रिज्म एंड मार्क इट्स बाउंड्री A B C Remove the prism on the side AB mark a point E At the point E draw a normal ED at right angles on the face AB replace the glass prism On the line DE fix two common pins P1 and P2 in an upright position such that the distance between the pins is 5 cm or more look for the images of pins p1 and p2 from the face bc fix two more common pins p3 and p4 such that these pins and the images of pins p1 and p2 are in the same straight line remove the pins and draw small circles around the pin points join p3 and p4 by the line hg and produce it forward to meet the side ac at f produce the line de forward to ek such that it meets ac at f measure the angle hfk it is the angle of deviation the magnitude of angle of deviation is 60 degree reasons for the path taken by the ray de the ray de strikes the face ab at right angles and hence undergoes refraction this ray strikes the surface ac of the glass prism at an angle of 60 degree as the angle of incidence in the glass on the surface ac is 60 degree which is more than the critical angle of the glass 42 degree therefore the ray suffers total internal reflection the totally reflected ray turns through an angle of 60 degree and strikes the surface bc at right angle as the totally reflected ray fg strikes the surface bc at right angles it does not suffer any refraction and emerges along gh the angle of deviation is the angle between the incident ray and the emergent ray in the present case the angle of deviation is equal to delta equal to angle hfk which is equal to 60 degree to determine the equivalent resistance of two resistors when connected in parallel apparatus required dry cell with terminals g6 ever ready cell 10 pieces of insulated thick copper wire with bare ends single key or one way key ammeter voltmeter rheostat 10 ohm two known resistors a and b of resistance 1 ohm and 2 ohm respectively sandpaper procedure rub the bare ends of the connecting wires with sandpaper so that bright shining copper metal is seen remove the plug from the one way key k connect tightly the key to the ammeter rheostat of 10 ohm only known resistors a and b of resistance 1 ohm and 2 ohm in parallel with the help of connecting wires to the dry cell 
connects the voltmeter in parallel to the combination of resistors A and B in parallel. Make sure that positive and negative terminals of voltmeter and ammeter are connected properly. If there is a zero error in ammeter and voltmeter, correct it by adjusting the adjustment screw. Insert the plug key and check that voltmeter and ammeter show deflection. Adjust the slider of the rheostat such that the ammeter shows deflection of 0 0.15 ampere. Read the value of the potential difference from the voltmeter. Again, adjust the slider of the rheostat such that the ammeter shows a current of 0 0.30 ampere. Read and record the values of potential difference and the current. Repeat the experiment four times more of the current value of 0 0.45 ampere. Zero point six zero ampere. Zero point seven five ampere. and 0 0.90 ampere. In each case, read and record the potential difference. Calculate mean equivalent resistance of the resistors. Mean equivalent resistance of resistors A and B connected in parallel equals total number of resistance in each case upon number of cases. Conclusion The mean resistance of resistors A and B in parallel is less than the individual resistance of resistors A and B. To trace the course of rays of light refracting through a glass lab at different angles, to measure the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction and the angle of emergence, to measure lateral displacement. Apparatus required Rectangular glass slab Geometry box with sharp pencil Four white sheets of paper Drawing board made of soft wood Four sharp and clean common pins Four drawing pins Procedure Spread the white sheet of paper on the drawing board and secure its corners with the help of brass drawing pins. In the middle of the white paper, place a glass block and mark its boundary with the help of sharp pencil. Remove the glass slab and mark a point F on the line AB such that AF is 2 cm to 3 cm. At point F, draw NN1 perpendicular normal to the line AB. With the help of protector measure, angle I equal to 30 degree. Join EF. Fix two common pins P1 and P2 in upright position such that Minimum distance between the pins is 5 cm. Replace the glass slab in its original position A, B, C, D. Looking from the slide C, D through the glass slab, locate the image L1 and L2 of the pins P1 and P2. Fix two more pins P3 and P4 such that these pins and the images of pins 
P1 and P2, that is, L1 and L2 are in the same straight line. Remove the glass slab. Remove the pins P1, P2, P3 and P4 and draw small circles around the pin points. Join pin points P3 and P4 by the line GH. Join FG by a straight line. Draw MM1 perpendicular normal to the line CD at point G. Produce line EF by a dotted line to point L. From point G, draw GK perpendicular to FL. GK represents the lateral displacement. Measure the angle of incidence I, angle of refraction R, angle of emergence E and lateral displacement. Tabulate the above measurements. Repeat the experiment for angle of incidence equal to 40 degree, 50 degree and 60 degree. Serial number, angle of incidence I, angle of refraction R, angle of emergence E, lateral displacement. 1. 30 degree, 19 degree, 30 degree, 13 mm. 2. 40 degree, 25 degree, 40 degree, 17 mm. 3. 50 degree, 31 degree, 50 degree, 22 mm. 4. 60 degree, 35 degree, 60 degree, 30 mm. Conclusions When the rays travel from air, to glass, the angle of refraction at the surface of separation is always less than angle of incidence. The angle of refraction increases with the increase in angle of incidence. The angle of emergence is always equal to angle of incidence. The incident ray is parallel to emergent rays. The glass slab displaces the path of incident ray laterally. The magnitude of lateral displacement increases with the increase in angle of incidence. To determine the focal length of a convex lens by focusing a distant object. Apparatus required. Double convex lens. Convex lens stand. Glass screen fitted with stiff white cardboard meter scale procedure locate some distant building or a tree from the window of your laboratory place the meter scale in the direction of the object place a convex lens duly mounted on a lens stand vertically along the meter scale such that the midpoint of its base is at 5 cm mark. Place the white screen behind the lens such that the base of lens stand and screen remain in line with scale. Move the screen backward or forward till a sharp, inverted and diminished image of the distant object is formed on it. Read and record the position of the lens and the screen by looking vertically down at the midpoints of their bases when a well-defined sharp image is formed on the screen. The distance between the position of the lens and screen is equal to the focal length of convex lens. Record the focal length of lens. Repeat the experiment by placing convex lens at 10 cm, 15 cm and 20 cm marks and in each case record the focal length.
calculate the mean or average focal length from the data. To study comparative cleaning capacity of a sample of soap in soft water and in hard water. Apparatus required. Two test tubes with test tube stand. A dropper. Chemicals required. Distilled water. Hard water. Soap solution. Procedure. Label the test tubes A and B by a black marker pen. Fill the test tube A by half with distilled water or soft water. Fill the test tube B by half with hard water. Add 5 drops of soap solution in each of the test tubes A and B. By putting your thumb on the mouth of each test tube, shake them vigorously. Observations A rich lather is produced in test tube A containing soft water. A sticky scum is produced in test tube B containing hard water. Conclusions Soft water is good for washing as it produces rich lather with the soap solution. Hard water produces sticky scum with soap solution and hence is unfit for washing purposes. To find the relationship between the distance of an object from a plane mirror to the distance of its image from the plane mirror. Apparatus required Wooden drawing board White sheet of paper Common pins Plane mirror with stand Geometrical instruments and a cello tape. Procedure Fix a white sheet of paper on the wooden drawing board with the help of cello tape strips. Draw a straight line in the middle of the paper. On the left hand corner of the straight line, mark a point L. Draw a perpendicular LN on the straight line and produce it backward along LN1. Mark points P, Q and R on the line NL such that PL is equal to 2 cm, QL is equal to 4 cm and RL is equal to 6 cm. Fix common pins on the points P, Q and R in an upright position. These pins represent the location of three objects and a distance of 2 cm, 4 cm and 6 cm respectively. Now place the plane mirror along the straight line and hold it in a mirror stand. Shifting towards right hand side, locate the image P1 of the object pin P. Fix two common pins A and B such that these pins and the image P1 are in the same straight line. Fix two more pins C and D such that these pins and the image P1 are in the same straight line. Remove the mirror and then the pins A, B, C and D. Draw small circles around the pin points of A, B, C and D. A, B and C, D represent reflected rays. Join A, B and produce it backward till it meets the line LN1. Join CD and produce it backward 
till it joins line LN1. It is seen that AB and CD on producing back meet at the point P1. Thus, P1 is the position of the virtual image formed by the plane mirror when P acts as an object. Measure the distance P1L and record it. P1L is equal to 2 cm. Repeat the experiment two more times by taking pin Q and pin R as the object at distances 4 cm and 6 cm respectively. Measure the distance of image Q1 and R1 from the plane mirror and record it. Q1L is equal to 4 cm and R1L is equal to 6 cm. From the table, it is clear that distance of the object from the plane mirror is equal to distance of the image from the plane mirror. Thus, we conclude images are formed as far behind the plane mirror as the object is in front of it. To show experimentally that light is necessary for photosynthesis. Materials required. Healthy potted plant. Two uniform pieces of black paper. Firm paper clips. Methylated spirit. Iodine solution. Spirit lamp. Petri dish. Forceps. Test tube. And test tube holder. Procedure. Select a healthy potted plant with green leaves. Place the potted plant in a dark room so as to destarch its leaves for 48 hours. After 48 hours, select a healthy leaf from it. Carefully select a healthy leaf. Cover a portion of the leaf on both sides with two uniform pieces of black paper so that the covered portion does not receive sunlight. Fix the paper in position with the help of paper clips. Now place the potted plant in sunlight for the whole day. Pluck the leaf at sunset and remove the papers. Place the leaf in boiling water in the test tube for a minute so as to kill it. Take out the leaf from water and place it in the boiling methylated spirit so as to remove the green-coloured chlorophyll. Now keep the leaf in a petri dish and add a few drops of iodine solution. After two minutes, take out the leaf from iodine solution and wash it with fresh water. Observations the exposed portion of the leaf turns blue-black. The covered portion of the leaf turns yellowish-brown. Conclusions One of the end products of photosynthesis is starch. As the starch turns blue-black on exposure to iodine, therefore, the areas turning blue-black are indicative of photosynthesis activities. No photosynthesis takes place in the areas which were covered with black paper. Thus, no starch is produced. This experiment clearly demonstrates that sunlight is essential for photosynthesis. To observe and compare pressure exerted by solid iron cuboid on sand while resting on its three different faces and to calculate the pressure exerted in three different cases. Apparatus required A solid cuboid of iron of sides 1 cm into 2 cm into 3 cm 
A rectangular wooden frame of sides 10 cm into 10 cm into 3 cm. A spring balance to 200 gram force weights, wet sand, a small measuring scale. Procedure Spread paper on the table and place the rectangular wooden frame of size 10 cm into 10 cm into 3 cm over it. Pour wet sand in the frame till 3 cm of sand is filled in the frame. Spread the sand evenly with the help of measuring scale so that a smooth and horizontal surface of it is formed. Find the weight of the solid cuboid by tying it to the hook of a spring balance with the help of cotton thread. Record the weight. Place the solid cuboid gently on the sand without any jerk, such that its surface area of 3 cm into 2 cm is in contact with sand. Place 200 gram force weight gently on the cuboid without any jerk. You will notice that the cuboid sinks slightly in the sand. This is on account of pressure exerted by the cuboid. Remove gently 1. 200 gram force weight 2. Cuboid Notice the depression created and measure it with measuring scale. Smoothen the surface of sand and again place solid cuboid on it without jerk such that its surface area of 3 cm into 2 cm is in contact with sand. Place 2 200 gram force weights gently on the cuboid without any jerk. You will notice that the solid cuboid sinks more as compared to step 5. Remove gently 1 200 gram force weights 2 cuboid. Notice the depression created and measure it with measuring scale. Repeat the experiment when 1. Surface area of 2 cm into 1 cm is in contact with sand. 2. Surface area of 3 cm into 1 cm is in contact with sand and follow the step 5 to 9. Observations and calculations. Zero error in the spring balance is equal to 2 gram force. Observed weight of the iron cuboid is equal to 42 gram force. Corrected weight of the iron cuboid is equal to 42 minus 2 gram force is equal to 40 gram force. Total thrust when 200 gram force weight is used is equal to 200 gram force plus 40 gram force is equal to 240 into 9.8 divided by 1000 is equal to 2.352 Newton. Total thrust when 400 gram force weight is used is equal to 400 gram force plus 40 gram force is equal to 440 into 9.8 divided by 1000 is equal to 4.312 Newton. Surface area of 3 cm into 2 cm is equal to 6 cm square is equal to 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 m square. Surface area of 2 cm into 1 cm is equal to 2 cm square is equal to 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 m square. Surface area of 3 cm into 1 cm is equal to 3 cm square is equal to 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 m square. 
contact surface area thrust pressure is equal to force upon area 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square 2.352 newton 2.352 newton divided by 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square is equal to 0 0.392 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equal to 3920 pascal 4.312 newton 4.312 newton divided by 6 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square is equal to 0 0.7187 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equal to 7187 pascal 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square 2.352 newton 2.352 newton divided by 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square is equal to 1.176 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equal to 1.1760 pascal 4.312 newton 4.312 newton divided by 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 into meter square is equal to 2.156 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equal to 21560 pascal 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square 2.352 newton 2.352 newton divided by 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 meter square is equal to 0 0.784 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equal to 7840 pascal 4.312 newton 4.312 newton divided by 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 4 into meter square is equal to 1.437 into 10 raised to the power 4 newton per meter square is equual to 14370 pascal conclusions the pressure exerted by a solid increases with the thrust or force the pressure exerted by a solid increases with the decrease in area of contact precautions the sand should not be filled in wooden frame very tightly the sand should be wet but not dripping water Take accurate measurements of dimensions of cuboid before finding the surface area. Do not place the cuboid on sand with a... To test the presence of starch in the given food sample. Materials required. Test tube. Starch solution, that is, water extract from boiled rice. Iodine solution. Dropper. Test tube holder. Procedure. Take a few milliliter of starch solution in a test tube with the help of a dropper. Now, Add a few drops of iodine solution to it. Observe the change in color of the mixture. Observation The color of the mixture changes to blue-black. Inference The color of given sample shows the presence of starch. To study the dependence of potential difference V across a resistor on the current I passing through it and determine its resistance. Also, plot a graph between V and I. Apparatus required. Dry cell with terminals. G6 Everready cell. 10 pieces of 
thick insulated copper wire with bare ends. Single key or one-way key. Ammeter. Voltmeter. Rheostat, 10 ohm. Resistor of approximately 2 ohm resistance. Sandpaper. Procedure. Rub the bare ends of the connecting wires with sandpaper so that bright shining copper metal is seen. Remove the plug from the one-way key. Connect tightly. The key, the rheostat of 10 ohm only, the ammeter and the resistor in series with the connecting wires to the dry cell. Connect a voltmeter in parallel to the resistor. Make sure that positive and negative terminals of voltmeter and ammeter are connected correctly. If there is a zero error in ammeter or voltmeter, correct it with the help of adjustment screw. Insert the plug key and check that ammeter and voltmeter show deflection. Now, adjust the slider of the rheostat such that the ammeter shows a current of 0 0.1 0 ampere. Read the value of potential difference from the voltmeter. Record the values of current and potential difference. Again, adjust the slider of the rheostat such that ammeter shows a current of 0 0.20 ampere. Read the value of potential difference from voltmeter and record it. Repeat the experiment four more times for the values of current 0 0.3 ampere, 0 0.4 ampere, 0 0.5 ampere and 0 0.6 ampere. And in each case, read and record potential difference. Remove the plug key after finishing experiment. Calculate the mean resistance of the resistor. Mean resistance of the resistor equals total of the resistance in each case upon number of cases. Plot a graph between V and I by taking V on Y axis and I on X axis. Join all the points with the help of a narrow line. A straight line is formed. Conclusions From table As the ratio of V upon I is a constant quantity R, therefore V is directly proportional to I. This verifies Ohm's law, which states that Potential difference at the ends of a conductor is directly proportional to the current flowing through it, provided all physical properties of the conductor remain the same. The resistance of the conductor is the ratio of potential difference and the current. From graph As graph is straight line, therefore, V is directly proportional to I. This verifies the Ohm's law. The slope of the graph V by I is the magnitude of resistance. To verify the laws of reflection of sound. Apparatus required. Two aluminium tubes highly polished from inside with a length of 25 centimeter and diameter 2 cm. 2 toothpicks. Cello tape. Full drawing sheet. Geometry box. Tuning fork. Rubber pad. Plasticine. Metal plate. Procedure. 
Spread the full drawing sheet on a table and hold it in place with the help of cello tape strips. In the middle of the drawing sheet, draw a straight line and on it mark point B. At point B, draw a perpendicular. Place the highly polished metal plate along the line MM1 in vertical position and hold it in place with plaster seam. Take each of the metallic tubes highly polished from inside and on their inner ends. Fix a toothpick with the help of sellotape. Place one metallic tube on the left hand side of the normal such that toothpick A is in line with point B and makes an approximate angle of 30 degrees to 40 degrees. Place the second metallic tube on the right hand side of the normal such that toothpick C is in line with point B. Ask a classmate to strike a tuning fork with rubber pad and hold it near the tube on the left hand side. Do not touch it. Put your ear close to the tube on the right hand side. Move the tube sideways till you clearly hear the sound of the tuning fork. For hearing sound, there should be a complete silence in the laboratory. Mark lines with the help of pencil along the toothpicks. Remove the tubes. Extend the lines in the form of dotted lines. Measure the angle of incidence on the left-hand side of the normal and the angle of reflection on the right-hand side of the normal. Repeat the experiment three more times by changing the angle of incidence. Record the angle of reflection in each case. Result Within experimental limits, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. As the incident sound wave, the normal and the reflected sound wave lie in the plane of drawing paper. Therefore, they lie in the same plane. To trace the path of a ray of light passing through a rectangular glass slab for different angles of incidence. Measure the angle of incidence, angle of refraction and the angle of emergence and interpret the result. Apparatus required Soft drawing board Four sharp common pins Two white sheets of paper Rectangular glass slab Protractor Four drawing pins. Scale. Sharp pencil. Procedure. Fix a white sheet of paper on the soft drawing board with the help of drawing pins. Place the rectangular glass slab in the middle of white sheet of paper and draw its boundary A, B, C, D with a sharp pencil. Remove the glass slab. On the side of AB, mark a point E. Draw a perpendicular NM at point E. NM is normal to the surface AB. With the help of a protractor, make angle PEN equals 30 degrees. This is the angle of incidence. Fix two pins P and Q on the line PE in an upright position by applying a gentle pressure with the help of thumb or forefinger. Keeping distance between them about 5 cm. 
replace the glass block in its boundary A, B, C, D. Looking through side C, D. Locate the images of the pins P and Q which appear at P1 and Q1 respectively due to the refraction. Looking at the images of pins P and Q, fix two more pins R and S in an upright position by keeping I at a distance of 30 cm from the nearest point, such that these pins and the images of pins P and Q are in the same straight line. Remove the pins P, Q, R and S one by one and draw small circles around the pin points with the help of a sharp pencil. Remove the glass slab. Join points R and S by a straight line such that the line meets CD at F. Join EF. Draw a normal at point F on the straight line CD. Measure and record the angle of incidence and the angle of emergence in whole numbers only. Repeat the experiment for angles of incidence as 40 degrees, 50 degrees and 60 degrees. In each case, measure and record angle of emergence. Conclusions As the difference between the angle of incidence and angle of emergence is within the experimental limits, that is, plus minus 1 degree. Therefore, angle of incidence equals angle of emergence. Incident ray is parallel to the emergent ray. Angle of refraction is less than angle of incidence when the rays of light travel from the rarer to the denser medium. With the increase in the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction increases. 1. To find relationship between the effective length of a simple pendulum and its time period. 2. To plot a graph between the effective length L and the square of time period T square and hence find slope of graph. 3. To calculate acceleration due to gravity using the formula 4 pi square into slope. Apparatus required Brass bob suspended from a light and preferably unspun cotton thread at least 120 cm in length. Iron stand with a clamp Cork cut vertically into two halves Meter scale Vernier calipers and a stop watch. Procedure With the help of vernier calipers, find the diameter of the brass bob correct to nearest millimeter using main scale only. Record the diameter. Calculate and record radius R of the brass bob by dividing the diameter by 